sir, we are requesting them to join. Slowly they are joining, sir. Slowly they are joining. <laughs> यार एंकर शैला ना शैला श्वेता हर टीम इज इन द कॉलेज सर कॉलेज बंद पटी दरा औरो बिकॉज़ ये प्रॉब्लम आग बार दोन थे इंटरनेट प्रॉब्लम यून किरण अलग इतना कॉलेज नले गोत्तील सर आई डोंट नो So I think uh, it is seven point seven fifty nine. Eight will start. Hmm. Sunil Kumar College, Bharatay Dhir. No, sir. College is not. Okay. कॉलेज ले पीएचडी स्टूडेंट्स इधर हैं सर इस मार्ट पर ये ना वन फुल वर्चुअल है ये ना हाँ फुल वर्चुअल सर ये बात ना ले स्टूडेंट्स डू नॉट वांट टू प्रेजेंट नो स्टूडेंट वांट्स टू प्रेजेंट इन पर्सन नहीं सर बैंगलोर वाले दे वर नॉट कंफर्टेबल सो वी हैव आस्क्ड देम टू प्रेजेंट ऑनलाइन � we have taken the video and the ppt also only yeah, if there is some their, you tested the connection of all the presenters no sir no no bartar sir because uh, if there is some emergency we will play their video sir only uh, if there is some emergency we have no, the videos of all the we have shared the those links yesterday only no, if there is some pro we should have uh, tested the connections also ah okay sir. Okay, we can start it. Shaila. Hi, Shaila. Hi. Very good morning to one and all present. On behalf of the organizing committee, 16th International Conference on Information Processing, IC in Pro 2021. I, Dr. Shaila K, Professor, Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering and Placement Officer at Vivekananda Institute of Technology, Bengaluru, is delighted to welcome you all to the second day of the conference. The tutorial and inaugural function of IC Intro 2021 took place yesterday. This IC Intro 2021 conference provides an insight for each individual to develop the skills for tomorrow. The keynote address helps us to enhance our knowledge with the new technologies. IC Impro 2021 includes seven keynote addresses. That includes artificial intelligence and machine learning, technical computing, signal processing applied to AI and ML, establishment of startups using these new technologies, and future 6G internet. I welcome all the keynote speakers to IC in Pro 2021. A warm welcome to our first keynote speaker, Sajil K. Das, to IC in Pro 2021. Welcome, you, sir. Welcome, Namaste. sir. Namaste. Welcome, Professor Sajil Namaste. Das. Namaste. Namaste. It is my privilege to welcome Professor L. M. Patnaik, Agent. Professor INSA Senior Scientist, Nias, India. Thank and you, Madam. I say Namaste, Namaste, sir. Namaste, sir. Namaste, Namaste. 2021 to the second day of the conference. Now I request you, sir, to address the participants. You introduce my day. Tamil Martyrs. Tamil, right? Okay. Okay, Professor Sajal. Uh, oh, I will just uh, take a minute. I think Professor Shaila, Madam, will formally introduce uh, Professor Sajal. I don't want to come between you and uh, Professor Sajal. Uh, I know him for over several years. 
he was uh, one of my distinguished uh, students at in an institute of science he did his uh, masters here his project uh, under my supervision uh, worked uh, in the area of petri nets in those days he was quite uh, dynamic a bright uh, student in the class then he went abroad did his phd with, uh, with professor narsingh dev Uh, who is very well known in graph theory you might have uh, used his textbook and after that he has switched over areas into several different thing to sensor networks now ai machine learning distributed computing systems you name it and uh, he has got uh, several uh, laurels awards i triple fellowship he has been with nsf as a director occupying chair professor positions published extensively with uh, the uh, very large number of uh, citations recently he was awarded the iis distinguished alumnus award i know him i am very proud to be associated with him and uh, having produced a student of his caliber professor sajal thank you thank you sir it is my honor and privilege to welcome professor venugopal k r honorable vice chancellor of bangalore university bengaluru and program chair 2021 before starting with the keynote address and presentation session i request you sir to give the inaugural address for the keynote and the sessions so oh, thank you one and all this is not the inaugural session we are all eagerly waiting uh, for professor uh, sajal das lecture keynote lecture i am indeed very happy and privileged that professor sajal das is able to i am in mean, deliver his key, first keynote at lecture for the 16th uh, international conference thank you very much sir for uh, being present and uh, delivering this lecture at university visheshwaraya college of engineering i hope it will be a very fruitful one and it will be very useful to all the research scholars who are already logged in now for the registered to this conference uh, i have once again thank you and expecting uh, that uh, it will be a very nice session especially in the morning at 8 o'clock here and it might be in the very late in the night for sajal yadas but uh, thank you for putting up with such inconvenience and trying to address this conference thank you sir thank you for the kind invite I would like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. P. Deepa Shanai, Madam, Syndicate Member and Dean, Faculty of Engineering, Bangalore University, Bengaluru, and Professor of Department of Computer Science, UECE, and Organizing Committee Chair, IC Intro 2021, to the second day of the of this function. Thank you so much, Shaila. Good morning. A warm welcome to Dr. H. N. Ramesh, Principal, UECE. Dr. Dilip Kumar, Chairperson, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and Chairpersons of all the departments of UECE, and Training and Placement Officer UECE. I welcome Dr. Triveni Madam, Dr. K. B. Raja Sir, Pushpa Madam, for today's keynote address. It is indeed a pleasure to welcome all the authors and participants from various organizations. faculty members of uece and other institutions research scholars and volunteers to this keynote address i hope that everyone will make use of today's and tomorrow's sessions now i request ms shweta research scholar department of csc to introduce the first keynote speaker sajal k das for this conference Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce today's first keynote speaker, Dr. Sajal K. Das, sir. Dr. Sajal K. Das' academic genealogy includes Thomas Alva Edison as a professor of computer science and Daniel Saint Clair, endowed chair at Missouri University of Science and Technology, where he was the chair of computer science department during 2013 to 2017. Prior to 2013, he was a university distinguished scholar. Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and Funding Founding Director of Center for Research in Wireless Mobility and Networking at University of Texas at Arlington. During 2008 to 2011, Dr. Das served the U.S. National Science Foundation as a Program Director in the Computer and Network System Division. His research interests include wireless and sensor networks, mobile and pervasive computing, 
smart environment cps and iot parallel and cloud computing cyber security social and biological networks applied graph theory and game theory he has contributed significantly to these areas and published extensively and has co-authored four books he is a five us patent holder and has directed and funded projects totaling 20 million dollars as h index is 93 with more than 35800 citations according to google scholar dr das is the founding editor in chief of lcvs pervasive and mobile computing journal since 2005 and serves as associate editor of several journals he is the founder of ieee perform warmom smartcom and icdcn conferences he has served as general and program chair of numerous conferences is a recipient of 11 best paper awards in prestigious conferences he has won numerous awards for teaching mentoring and research including ieee computer society's technical achievement award for pioneering contributions to sensor networks and mobile computing and university of missouri system presidents award for sustained career excellence dr das graduated 46 phd students 31 ms thesis students and 11 post doctoral fellows today Sir will be presenting on the title from smart sensing to smart living the role of ai ml and data science welcome you sir i request you to take over the session thank thank you thank you very much so do i have the permission to share yeah okay, let me just share the screen then we'll start but it says host disable participant screen sharing so i think you need to enable that sir so now you have to share sir i think now probably i can do it can you see the screen now yes sir yes okay good it's just starting yeah just starting yes. so you see the uh, yeah we are able yeah. to see the screen wonderful wonderful thank you so thank you professor venugopal for uh, inviting me to icn pro uh, and i'm very delighted to deliver the keynote talk this morning and very glad to see professor patnaik and is you know it is very difficult to give a keynote talk when your professor is sitting in the audience and i'm really thankful and grateful to professor patnaik for giving us the impetus and show us the joy and beauty of doing research when i was a master student i did not know that i'll be doing phd but he's mentoring and guidance actually really encouraged me to enjoy research to the fullest extent and so whatever i have achieved uh, i think uh, he is always very modest so i could attribute uh, this particular keynote talk and dedicate to him because of him actually what i am today and as well as professor narsing dev he mentioned my advice a phd advice okay so now what i am going to do in the next uh let me just minimize something over here just one second in the next okay fine i, I just minimize the pictures on the right side so in the next uh, 40 45 minutes time i'm going to give a guided tour of different things that we have been working for last two decades so it is not like a one paper that i'm presenting so it will be an overview of different thing when i ask professor uh, venugopal and professor senoy as well as professor shaila that uh, they thought probably giving a broad perspective would be much better as a keynote talk and which i'll be doing but if there will be any interest uh, i'll be very happy to go into the depth of any of the topics so it will not be just one thing but a conglomeration of different things that we have been working on since 2000 2001 uh, the theme that i have chosen because we have been working in smart environment since 2000 2001 we're starting with the first nsf project that we got funded in this area to build a smart home uh so what you see over here the first book that we wrote in 2005 on smart environments technologies protocols and apps that came out of one of the nsf projects that we did a lot of research and it culminated into a book with my colleague dian cook uh another theme that you'll be hearing in this particular talk is cyber physical systems so the latest book we got published last year by cambridge university press is principles of cyber physical systems with a colleague of mine at washington state university dr shandeep roy and then in 2012 we did write another book on securing cyber physical critical infrastructures on foundations and challenges and incidentally we had a, i i was at a, a program director at national science foundation in the us 
in those days, in 2008 to 2011. So we conducted a cybersecurity workshop in conjunction with IUSTF in the US Science and Technology Forum, which is part of DST Wing in Bangalore. And that actually led to this theme of this book eventually. But why am I mentioning over here? Because in my presentation, I'll talk about smart environments, cyber physical systems, internet of things, and then how they all lead to what we call smart living eventually. So it's from smart sensing to smart living and the role of AI, machine learning and data science. So I'll not go into any specific details of any of the particular techniques, but I'll give a broad overview exactly how they are related that how AI machine learning is playing a significant role and data driven approach, data science approach. Before I start my part of the talk technical, I wanted to show you a beautiful uh, slide our campus is very beautiful, University of Missouri, uh, Missouri University of Science and Technology. It's a small college town in the middle of uh, Missouri in Rolla. Uh, the university was founded 150 years ago in 1870. So this year actually we are celebrating last year and this year 150th anniversary of the university. Right? And our computer science department is very old, started in 1965. When I was department chair in 2015, we celebrated the 50th anniversary, golden jubilee of the department. So this is a beautiful picture that you see, and you see a lot of different things. For example, on the right side, the solar village or eco village. These are the solar houses built by the students as part of their design project. And these are living houses, smart living. We collect a lot of data there. And similarly, solar car and all these things that you see. So that's the one thing that I wanted to show that the different things that are going on. And the ladies are computer science students, and we had smart computing as the theme going forward uh, uh, for the department for the next 50 years. Now, this is a warm up question for all of you, and I don't want to spend too much time, but if I ask you the question, who is the founder of Facebook? I'm sure that you all know that Mark Zuckerberg is the founder of Facebook, and we all know it, right? And it won't take any seconds for answering the question. But if I ask the question, who is the co-founder, right now the co uh, CEO as well, co-founder and CEO of Twitter, um, is there anybody in the audience who can just say immediately, who is the CEO of Twitter or co-founder? And this is a question for the audience. Twitter came much earlier than Facebook. OK, so in case I don't hear anything. So he was Jack Dorsey. But Jack Dorsey, the point I'm bringing, actually, he was a student in our department. He spent the first two years of his undergraduate in our department, then moved to New York with his parents because his parents got relocated there. And I'm not advertising for Twitter nor Square. So Square is also a mobile. A payment mechanism through your smartphone. You see what he is holding in his is a chipset, and the chipset you can connect with the mobile phone. Point I'm making that our department has produced a lot of illustrious computer scientists, entrepreneurs, um, business uh, corporate leaders. Uh, so the department is quite matured in that sense. And another thing that I'll be pointing out over here, since the talk I'm giving in Bangalore, this is a special slide I prepared for all of you. I do have a very strong collaboration with different institutes in India. And these collaborations are not just in paper. We, are, we write papers, actually. We write papers, we post by students. And in 2019 fall, I spent two, three months at IIC Bangalore as part of my sabbatical and also another two, three months in IIT Kharagpur. So this is a quick snapshot that um, I have my passion of doing research uh, with my students, with my postdocs, my colleagues, as well as colleagues uh, all over the world. I think Professor Potnayak mentioned that briefly. And with India, particularly, I have a very sharp corner as usual that you can think. So I leave it over here and I'm very appreciative of the collaboration that is going on with different colleagues in different parts uh, in India. And maybe one day, Bangalore University, you will see somebody and I will be collaborating. So this is an outline of my talk. So, first part will be a little warm up session in terms of the technology progress that is happening, leading to. Uh, not only just smart sensing, but smart living. So smart sensing, if you think about sensors and IoT devices, smart devices, they collect a lot of data, right? And this data gets distributed through networking and you collect huge amount of data. That's why the big data analytics, data science coming in the picture. And that is so huge that you need to do most of the high performance computing as well as machine learning, uh, AI, because you want to find significant pattern in those data. And that significant pattern would mean something and you can do a very informed inferencing the conclusion. Okay, that's why the sensing, data collection, networking, computing, and then the application. That's the arena that we actually work on. 
So we'll touch upon the cyber physical system, cyber physical human system in particular in the smart environment. Then I'll talk about four different pillars that we are working on right now. And we have a lot of other pillars like smart agriculture, we have another project. So these are the different projects we have. I'll touch upon some of them. Then you'll see implicitly how AI, machine learning, data science play a significant role there, okay? So mobility is the transportation part, human mobility, vehicular mobility, energy, that could be smart grid, healthcare, smart health, and smart resilience means when there is a disaster, natural disaster or man-made disaster that happens, how do you really bring back the normalcy? So those are the things that we'll be talking about very briefly. Now, in our group, as I mentioned, over the years, I'm talking about 30 years of research in different contexts, starting from distributed computing, then mobile computing, progressive computing, sensor networks, now cyber physical system security. So our group research has evolved from, so networking that you see at the bottom layer, so we assume the presence of devices and wireless technology. Sometimes we build our own wireless devices, our sensor devices to do prototypes and experiments, but by and large, we assume the technology is there. How do I take advantage of the technology in terms of research, right? So different types of networking research that you do, wireless networks, sensor networks, uh, even drones, I did not uh, mention over here, I do a lot of things on the drones, right? So this is networking. You collect the data through devices, you network them, distributed computing, and then a lot of computing paradigms that you use machine learning, data analytics, AI, and all. But the goal is to serve different types of smart applications. Could be smart city, smart energy, smart health, smart agriculture, smart transportation, all sorts of different things. Okay, that's what we do. And of course, these are not isolated, layered system like networking, computing applications. They're all integrated, okay? And also security, privacy, trust, resiliency, vulnerability are integral component. And that comes across networking, computing applications. And our research is more socio-technical. So we also collaborate with social scientists, psychologists, uh, medical practitioners, for example, depending on the application, right? So we also look into not only just the technical solutions, but also the economics, games, the policies, and how human behavior uh, makes things very interesting, especially when you talk about smart living. So people are the beneficiary. That's number one. Second thing is that we have a very powerful device in our hand called smart. Uh, phones, and that also allows us to crowd sense information, outsource information. That means human behavior becomes an integral part of the cyber physical system. So that's what you call cyber physical human. CPH stands for cyber physical human. Okay. Now, our forte basically is designing efficient solutions, networking, computing applications with different models, mathematical models. So it's the combination of theory and practice, but we derive or design very efficient solutions, be it an architectural solution, algorithmic solution, protocols, systems. But we do enough amount of modeling and analysis, optimization, problem formulation, algorithmic solution, performance evolution, and sometimes simulation experience, sometimes prototypes, test data implementation. That's what we do. That's the space. And you'll see that in some of the applications. Now, sensing has become very pervasive, as is wireless networking, communication, and all, right? So you can sense many different things, and this list is not ex exhaustive. So starting from the monitoring, let's say flood or water level, or monitoring the health condition of bridge or border monitoring, uh, even detecting seismic vibration in earthquake situation, industrial process control, tracking animals, even tracking the progress or spread of disease in trees, all sorts of different things, fire monitoring. So, Sensors, actually wireless sensors has given us a completely new dimension of observing a physical environment that we can understand, characterize, and try to manage it. This control is not like controlling nature or any of these systems, but how do I understand, or how do I bring back and functional reliability in the system? That's what it means. Now, all of this technology, as I mentioned, networking, device technology, pervasive computing, control, and human being part of the solution, that leads to what is cyber physical human system. Cyber physical human systems are as defined as natural or engineered system. Natural system means if you talk about smart health, that of human body is a natural system. If you talk about environmental monitoring, then outside environment is nature. Okay. An engineered system means that automobile, that building, that airport. These are all engineered systems, right? So this physical system could be a natural system or engineered system. But cyber physical system 
integrate sensing, communication, computing, and control. And if you put human in the loop, then it becomes cyber physical human system or CPH. Okay, that's the convergence that we deal with. But over the years, we have used a very simple paradigm to build the intelligence in the system. And this simple paradigm is nothing but sensing, reasoning, and control. And I'll elaborate on that. So sensing, you're capturing the data through devices. Okay. And once you get the data, that's the sensor networking part because the devices are there. You have a sensors or IoT devices, actuation devices. You collect the data. That's your networking part. But the power actually comes from the reasoning part. But how do you analyze this data? And that's where all the algorithmic models, machine learning models, AI models, data analytics models, everything is in the reasoning part. Then once you reason about, you find different patterns, different significant um, events that is happening, even anomalous events. In a healthcare condition, an anomalous may mean uh, uh, health risk. In a security context, it may mean a security threat. Right? So depending on the application, right? So then reasoning is the engine. And that's what actually we contribute as much as possible. Sensing, of course, we do. That's part of the data collection. And once you collect, analyze it, your job is not done. Because if you say control, there should be a feedback control loop to make it a cyber physical or cyber physical human system. And that control loop goes to an actuation part. And once you complete that loop, then it becomes a cyber physical system, cyber physical human system. Human is also part of the loop in the decision making or taking action. Now, once you go through the iterated loop, you are also building the intelligence in the system because what I observe through sensing, through analytics, I make significant decisions that is paid back to the environment to improve the conditions of the environment. And you go through this loop until you saturate the information, saturate the intelligence. So that's why the AI machine learning becomes an integral part of the CPH or CPH system. Okay. Now, one thing I'll make over here that sometimes you see a lot of debates and discussions and panels. They say, oh, cyber physical systems, this is IoT, um, are the different things, they're same thing. In my opinion, there are two sides of the coin. IoT means Internet of Things. That means every object is connected to the internet, right? That's a very micro level, building blocks, sensing actuation devices, IoT devices. But these building blocks together, they make a macro system that becomes cyber physical system, cyber physical human system, like a smart grid, electrical grid with lots of sensors, IoT devices. You talk about smart transportation, whether you have automobiles on the road, you have roadside units, uh, you have traffic controllers, or even on the roads, you have the sensor linings on the asphalt. So all these things together is a macro system, for example. So healthcare, for example, IoT device, wearable sensors, they monitor our health conditions, body, vital signs, and everything. But together, we are building a system that becomes a smart healthcare system with a decision support. So basically, as a macro level concept, is a cyber physical system, micro level is IoT. But these are very complementary. And no IoT system you can build without sensing component. Most of it sensing and actuation as well. But without sensors, IoT device has no existence. That's why most of the papers that you see on IoT has an inbuilt sensing component, a sensor networking component. Now, this particular one, while well, you will be setting the stage and then I'll move to the actual uh, technical part of the talk, and that you're dealing with three systems, so a cyber system, physical system, so human system, right? And see the physical world, think about the aircraft. Airbus or Boeing aircraft, right? That's a physical system. It has its own aerodynamics controlled by the Navier-Stokes equations. All sorts of different things that uh, basically runs the uh, aircraft, okay? But guided by the natural laws, physics-based models, huge amount of uncertainty. But the notion of time is continuous because the differential equations, Navier-Stokes equations, are continuous time, right? That's the way the physical world is. I'm just giving that as an example because an aircraft. Running is a classic example of a cyber physical system, right? So your aircraft is the physical system. When it is, who runs the aircraft? It's not the pilot or the captain. They are there for takeoff and landing and emergency control. But as you know, most of the systems are controlled by, when it's airborne, by an autopilot system, which is a real-time embedded software system. And this real-time embedded software a huge amount of code, typically 25 to 30 million lines of code. And that is a cyber world. In the cyber world, there is no physical laws. There are computational models, the software abstractions, the architectural st stack, and clock is digital. 
So think about your physical system is your aircraft. When airborne is completely controlled by a cyber system, an autopilot software system, real-time embedded software that can navigate, that can reroute depending on the weather conditions up in the air. If there's thunderstorm, it will reroute. If it cannot even uh, land, it will hover around. All sorts of different things are happening to the cyber world. So and one, in one case, there's a continuous clock. In the other case, cyber part is a digital clock. So a little clock drifting can actually create a lot of instabilities that you can imagine, right? Now on top of that, this, in this particular example, the pilot and captain, they are the human beings. They're also decision maker in the process, so much as the cyber system, because they take control and override when necessary. They are responsible for takeoff and landing, right? Sometimes there are accidents if they cannot land properly. So, but human world is not controlled by natural laws. Our human body is controlled by natural laws, but our behavior, our mood, our actions, right? There are a lot of bounded rationality theory. There are lots of socioeconomic theories out there. But the, again, these are behavioral models. The psychology is involved, social science is involved, human dynamics is involved, huge amount of uncertainty. So your life, our life is at stake at every moment in the cyber physical world, human world. And these are three different worlds called together, right? And of course, you take the intersection in the Venn diagram, you get either the cyber physical system or cyber physical human system or cyber human, right? So think about, but our life is still good. You still take flights, we still drive automobiles and all these things. So over the years, systems has been perfected, but still, if you think of self-driving car, there are now and then accidents because of multiple reasons. So, Making these systems very reliable, very robust is extremely challenging problem. And making them secure, now that they're all on the internet, right? an adversary can actually attack any of these systems. And that happens. Now, just to summarize the first part, which is the stage setting up, right? So we are talking about, now what are we doing in our research? So basically, we have different types of cyber physical human systems that you can think of. I've just listed a few, smart energy, energy management of a building, uh, smart grid energy, efficiency management, also smart healthcare, transportation mobility, water management, disaster management, agriculture, environmental pollution control, all sorts of different things applications you can think. Now, these applications are so different because the physics are different, physics models are different. But the good news is that when everything is in data format, that means I collect data from all of these things through devices and all, then data has certain nature that we have full control as computer scientists and engineers. And that data can seal the physical model, right? So what do we mean basically? That what are the common mathematical invariants that we can define out of this time series data? So you see that how data analytics is coming in the picture to analyze the data, machine learning, and AI will come in the picture whether I say explicitly or not, right? So that's exactly what I can say. That, okay, these applications are all different. The physics are all different, but. How could I find a commonality so that I can develop a platform and substrate, which is our middleware service, where I hide all the models, all the mathematics, but then I fine tune and cater to the different application needs so that I don't have to find solution for each of these application areas. That's first part of our objective, right? And of course, underneath what you see is a uh, sensor, IoT, wireless networks, because that gives the infrastructure to collect the data to exchange the information. But at the end of the day, I'm serving all these applications at the top. And in the middle, I'm building all my models. And that's actually what we do. And these systems are extremely complex, complex systems of systems, very heterogeneous. In every level, device level, networking level, computation level, application level. Scale varies from micro to macro, in spatial domain, in temporal domain, right? So making these systems are extremely challenging to make it very reliable and fundamentally very novel. And more than that, these systems are not isolated and independent, they're interdependent. This interdependency actually creates havoc. For example, when I'm driving a car on the road, the traffic light is controlled by the electrical grid. If the electrical grid fails, traffic light may not work, that may mean backup of the traffic congestion. So you see how the smart transportation got impacted because of failure in the smart grid. So, so, so on and so forth. So this interdependency makes it extremely challenging and research-wise interesting. And we actually build models on those. So we're talking about smart systems, intelligence building in the cyber, smart cyber physical environment. 
And we have been working on this for quite last two decades and I'll not go into all the details. So the way we defined in our book, and it's very qualitative, but I'll also point out that many things that actually can be quantified, some things cannot be quantified, okay? So we define smart system as one that can acquire information autonomously. It's an autonomous system. And you basically observe the interactions of the users with the environment, and then try to make inference through learning without users explicit awareness. That's why it's smart. That means it understands the habits and the preferences of the users and then make decisions on their behalf, okay? And in very naturally the context awareness situation awareness becomes a key component, right? But the interesting thing is that there's lots of interdependent context. Some contexts are human-centric, some are very technology-centric. By social, I did not mean social networking or social media. The social, I meant human-centric, right? So you can see that some of the technological context, like your location, your mobility, your activity, occupancy in a building, all these things can be tracked through transducers, through cameras, through devices, right? But when it comes to the human-centric thing, desire, mood, behavior, emotions, intent, these are very personalized context, very difficult to capture because the same stimulus may mean different interpretation in terms of behavior, mood, and all. And our life, daily life is guided by those human-centric context, and then that get manifested into that technical context. For example, if I, my goal is I want to go to Indian Institute of Science, that intent will be the driving force to define which route I should take from my home to the campus. And that will define my location, my mobility, my activity in the next one hour, two hours. You can just see that the driving force comes from the human intent, human mood, behavior, emotions, and all these things. This is very difficult to capture because you're talking about the brain signals. And there are headgears, EEG, headgears to capture brain signal, but these are very personalized. We don't have enough data to even learn. Every person is so different. So that's what is challenging. So we are working with psychologists, neurologists, um, sociologists to understand exactly how to interpret. But te technological context, you can define mathematically through models. But some of the human centric is very difficult to capture because there's rationality, all sorts of irrationality things are involved. So those are the challenges. So I'm actually throwing many different concepts. So if you're looking for uh, PhD students, research scholars looking for topics for research, master students, whatever, even new faculty members. Now, these are fertile ground to do research, fundamental research. So on, on one aspect, it's not an engineering exercise. We have built homes. For example, we have built a smart home when I was at the University of Texas or Arlington, and we have built smart labs. So, but in abstraction, what do you mean? You instrument whatever you want, but our environment, so let's say this is home, your smart home, but this home is a rational thinker. That's our starting point of the model. So instrument, you can see the all sorts of gadgets we can put. But it's engineering exercise is just one part of the game. But question, what are the fundamental research that is involved, okay? And we believe that is a thinker. So what it means, you perceive the state of the environment, your home, your bedroom, a city, through sensors and devices, smart devices and IoT devices to collect the data. But the power comes from the reasoning. And as I mentioned earlier, and that reasoning means I build the model. So you can see that even in this simple, so this is an environment, you take a snapshot and you come to the reasoning part. So see sensing reasoning control is a loop, but that's exactly what you're doing. So don't think that this is a two-step Markov model. I can actually decompose that hierarchically to much higher dimensions, right? Because I can keep on decomposing it. So, but the power comes in this reasoning part. So when I say my environment can think because I build models, algorithms, and these models come from machine learning, AI, data analytics, algorithmic solutions, all sorts of different things, and that's where the power comes. Now, I mentioned smart sensing to smart living. And what do I mean? All the things that we talked about, this slide is quite dense. So and people are the beneficiary, because I don't want to build a smart airport or smart infrastructure building only for the sake of it, because if people's comfort people's security, safety is not enhanced or whatever, or energy efficiency of the building, then there's no point in building such. So there are multiple players over here. You can see, you can assume this is a multi-agent system because on one hand, the environment of the system, the building, I want to 
maximize the utility, security, safety of the building, energy consumption of the building. If I think the people who are paying the bills, either the company or the individual householders, can I reduce their energy bill, for example, right? Can their house be more safe from robbery and theft? So you can think about, or can I save productive time of the users? So these are the utility and you have to quantify them, right? And you can put your fabric block over here. And we say smart and connected communities rather than smart city, because we don't want to leave out rural, uh, suburban places, rural places, villages. So it's connected community means we are connecting the community in different sectors. And then I want to give a smart services, right? And you can actually think about your application. But again, this sensing, reasoning, control is the paradigm to be used. But we do lots of mathematical. You look at our paper, it's a very good blend of theory and practice. So a lot of theories are there, so I'm skipping the details. Now, as I said, the approach is a data science approach. What do I mean? You have the networking technology, wireless, sensors, IoT, social network, any information feed that you want to think. That is the underneath architecture, okay? Different types of applications I mentioned, energy grid, healthcare, transportation, energy, but these are all physics-based model, different kinds of physics. Okay, there's no commonality between a healthcare, body area, sensor networking, versus a smart energy or transportation, right? But when it comes to the data, then we should be able to ex extract some mathematical invariance in the data, and that is very powerful. Okay, and once we have that, then we have to take it back. Okay, what does this data mean in the healthcare context, in energy context, and transportation context like that? So ultimately our goal basically, you crank the data, this of course you do high performance computing, cloud computing, uh, edge computing, whatever you want, but the models that we build, that's the reasoning part, okay? And eventually we are talking about improving the quality of life of people, that's what is smart thinking. That, Use of technology that improves our quality of life. And you can define the quality. These farmers, smart agriculture, that means they have a better crop yield, they have a better revenue, they have a better living, better health conditions. Okay. If you think about energy, I secured uh, the energy uh, failure, for example, uh, load shedding. People are paying less bill, energy consumption, you're saving the nature. The load, demand response load on the energy. Uh, uh, generation plants is reduced. So you define the utility. So as I mentioned, we develop lots of theoretical understanding of the problem, depending on the nature of the application, information theory, uncertainty reasoning, graph theory, online models, auction theory, uh, randomized machine learning, belief models. So these are the things that I'll be shielding you with all the theories in this talk, but believe us that we do develop systems and prototypes to validate and demonstrate that it works, but underneath we are doing the fundamental science. And we have been very lucky over the years, as I mentioned from 2000, 2001, we have been supported by National Science Foundation, different capacities, different projects over the years on things related to smart. So smart homes is the first one that we built even and did the research. You see from there, we transited into smart healthcare, uh, energy efficient homes, even cognitive health care, the mental health and other kinds of stuff, security, energy, uh, mobility, even agriculture. So we do different kinds of things, but underneath we are doing the fundamental science, but different applications that are challenging to solve. Okay. How much time would I have? Depending on that, I'll actually cover these topics. These are very modular and I can stop anytime and take question answer. So you can, be very frank in telling me how much more time I can take, but I'd like to keep some time for Q&A as well. Professor Venugopal, I know that your schedule is very tight, so I don't want to delay things, but at the same time, I'm mindful of, and I can actually do a very modular adjustment of the rest of the things now that I have given all the background. How much time should I take from now? You're muted, sir. I think you're still muted. Professor Benigopal. Yeah, they have muted me, so I, they're not allowing me to unmute. Okay. Oh, you, have, you, have time, you have time, sir. You can take your time. Uh, sir, okay. another, sir, another 10 minutes. Okay, another 10 minutes. Let me finish and then I'll take Q&A question yeah. answer. At the time, I can answer more questions, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, and I have this, you have a lot of slides. I'll go very quickly, fast through, but I think the things should be still clear, okay? So let me just finish in another 10 minutes and we'll take question answer and we'll answer more. 
things. Okay? So as I mentioned, smart mobility. So let's see the pillars. This pillar is not exhaustive. You can put your other favorite pillar, like for example, smart agriculture, uh, air pollution control, sound control, all sorts of different things. So our objective, as I mentioned, develop unified models and framework that cuts across different CPS and IoT domains. Okay. And I'll be just focusing on this thing and how to make them very secure and trustworthy. Energy, mobility, health, and resilience. Okay. And I'll be using this particular uh, pie chart to show these four pillars. So smart mobility, what we are doing, I'll just show the snapshot without going into the details. So our objective is basically to predict, learn and predict human mobility, vehicular mobility. And what is the goal? Goal is think about it congested city like Bangalore, for example, how do you do the transport planning, congestion control, accident prediction? And the more vehicles mean air quality is also getting impacted, right? If you think about delivery of supply chain, goods delivery. Uh, even the disease spread, when the humans are moving, you see why during the pandemic, coronavirus and COVID time, why do you think that all the transportations were closed, either flights, or bus and because you wanted to minimize the human mobility so that these things don't spread, right? So we actually look into those. So application of mobility has ramification in many different contexts and you can take it to that level. The pandemic spread, for example, how it is impacted by the human mobility. So with those kind of things that we do, we also look at the uh, crowd sensing based vehicular mobility control because people can actually, there are lots of different applications, Google uh, applications are there where if you download this application, then through smartphone, you can give the feedback and crowdsource information that might predict what kind of congestions are ahead next two hours or one hour. And then drivers are free to make the decision. So basically, if you think about people give crowdsource information through a smartphone, and a lot of people they do that, they're aggregated and summarized in the cloud. And based on what is observed, a report is generated and that goes back to the users, again, the other drivers, and then they take the decision whether I should take a, a different route or take an exit from here, all sorts of things. This is a feedback control that is going on, right? Human mobility has been working for a long time. Uh, you don't have to read everything over here. I have actually given some publication references, some references at conferences, some journals over the years we have been working on. I'm also looking into lots of drone and uh, un unmanned aerial vehicle uh, mobility, and especially in the agriculture disaster response application. But as you can see that, we are applying different methodology, information theory, algorithms, machine learning, dictionary compression, crowd sensing, I mentioned game theory, behavioral models. So you see AI, machine learning, data science becomes an integral part because you have a huge amount of data. And sometimes data may not have much meaning unless you harness it properly. You find significant patterns. You eliminate many of these data, those are routine data. And then this significant pattern sometimes may come as an anomaly, sometimes maybe a good one to classify. Okay, that's the way it does. Now, depending on what type of machine learning algorithms you use, then you take care of different things, either supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised learning, label data, unlabeled data, under uncertainty, noise, incomplete information, different types of games. You just develop your mathematical technique based on the application that you have, okay? And we have been also looking into intersection of vehicular network and social network, we call vehicular social network, okay? In the interest of time, I'll actually skip all the details that I have on different things and we can take they were in the QA time if necessary. I'm not showing any results, but different publications that we have been doing. So let's move into the smart energy. What are we doing over here? So this is the thing that we mentioned. The, what is the goal and what are the methodology, set of methodologies we are using, okay? Now in energy, what we are looking at, energy consumptions in the buildings, either household or the commercial buildings. Okay, in the energy smart grid, what you have here is smart, plant with generous energy. So that's the generation part. Then you have a distribution through high tension lines or local lines. And then the consumption side, that is more interesting because where humans are involved, okay? So we are looking at the AMI stands for advanced metering infrastructure, where the smart meters are involved. That's an IoT device, sensing actuation device. In the smart grid concept, households or the buildings, they have smart meters that monitors the energy consumption of the building from different appliances, including air conditioning and all sorts of household appliances that you can think of. Okay. Now, in this particular case, we are looking at if an adversary 
gets control of the smart meter and tries to manipulate the data. That's called data falsification attack or false data injection attack or data integrity attack. What would it mean that if you alter the data, your billing will be altered. Either you'll be paying as a consumer, higher or lower billing, depending on how the adversary is manipulating the data additively or subtractively. And that may also lead to a safety issue because if I put a huge surge artificially, energy consumption is high, the uh, circuit breaker or the fuse cannot handle it, house could be on fire. Okay, that's one point. Secondly, if there are collision attack on a series of homes in the neighborhood to the smart meters, then energy consumption can be altered to a certain extent that there's a huge demand response alteration, fluctuations. That may mean a load shedding that you call in India, in US we call it blackout. And that might also happen. So ramification is huge. So if you want to do load forecasting and anomaly detection, that's a good way. And the question is that if things happen like that, how do you mitigate the cascade failure? Because you don't want this propagation of this failure or the attacks in the entire city of Bangalore, for example. If it is in Yashantpur area, just try to localize it, mitigate it as best as possible. So those are the techniques, right? And then you have to make very secure and trustworthy decisions and human behaviors are involved because either from the attacker's point of view or consumer's point of view, okay? So we look into those. And then different types of methodology that we use, time series, data analytics, anomaly detection, state estimation, trust and reputation model, epidemic theory, AI machine learning, how to incentivize people so that they behave, behave more rationally. Prospect theory, which is also a social uh, science approach for human behavioral modeling. So we do that kind of stuff. Okay, I'm actually skipping again the details, but the threats and data manipulation by attackers in the advanced metering infrastructure is a very significant problem. This is not an artificial problem. And it has been observed and there are serious issues over there. I'm skipping again all the details over here. Now in the healthcare, we are looking at not only just physical activity monitoring or vital signs like blood pressure, sugar, um, health con heart conditions and all, but we are also looking at the cognitive health, which is the mental health. Somebody is mentally depressed, in anxiety, feeling lonely, and this has escalated during the pandemic time. If you think about students, People, because they have been captivated at home, they could not go to school, colleges, work, or they've lost their jobs. Think about how the mental pressure has been from child, children to adults, right? And we look into those kind of stuff. And then of course we look into fine grained activity recognition under uncertainty and all. And we have, in this particular space, we have a very interesting set of things. We have built our own smart share. Uh, you don't see it. So basically this is a deployment in the hospital that we have smart share. So when patients come, they're asked to sit on the chair, but we have sensor lining and wireless transceiver in the chairs that that's where we have built. And as the doctors and nurses, they do the experiments clinically, and we also have built our own wearable, but we also collect a lot of data that is wirelessly transferred to our lab. And you see how the chair looks like. Chair looks like this, very normal, but inside you have the lining, sensor lining, and they collect a lot of data, different kinds of data. So we have been actually working on that and here privacy is extremely important. Data fusion coming from multimodal sources is important, deep learning, parallel learning. So different types of mathematical models and the solution that we are developing. And I'm, I'll be actually concluding very soon because I'm skipping the details over here. And we have actually filed some pattern that also led to a startup company that I co-founded called Smart Health Beckons. So now in the resiliency, what do you mean if there is a, perturbation in the system. That means natural calamity. Let's say flood, hurricane, uh, cyclone, earthquake, or man-made disaster like terrorist attacks, for example. So question is, how do you bring back the normal operation of the system and daily life? So the question again would be, we deploy cyber physical systems, IoT sensors and all, with a goal to monitor, detect, and give early signals of something that might happen through anomalous events and then prevent if possible. So all the time we may not be able to prevent, right? Then you have to just think about how do I recover from that aftermath, okay? And we have been doing lots of interesting stuff. We have built prototypes to, um, and here also the technology as a methodology is very easy, sense of fusion, situation awareness, information theory, epidemic theory, machine learning, data mining, so on and so forth, okay? So I'm actually ready to conclude now in one or two more slides and then I'll take questions. 
Thank you for your attention. So we have been developing lots of different th mathematical theory. I'll not go into the details as I mentioned already. Coming back, what I started is cyber physical human system, the physical cyber. You can see that if you think about the teeth wheels, if I put now the human as another teeth wheel, then they are working in conjunction, sometimes synchronously, asynchronously. And failure in any of the system, either physical system or cyber system or human error, that might create havoc. Okay, making this system robust and reliable is extremely challenging, very important, because our life is at stake. Okay, now, conclusions wise, as I mentioned, sensing, reasoning, control is the key. And that's where you build the intelligence. Different applications you can think of. We talked about quite a few of those, right? Measuring the success of this type of solution is extremely challenging because it's a complex system of systems. Extremely complex in terms of modeling, in terms of understanding, huge amount of uncertainty, security, privacy, human behavior. You think that these three worlds are actually inter intricately interacting, okay? We take help of AI, machine learning, data science, and all, but still, huge amount of uncertainties there. But reach round for doing research, having huge impact, because these are our daily life that we actually encounter, right? So we can develop lots of fundamental science and theory, okay? Now, going forward, the things that we are looking at, our objective is not to make these systems very smart. But think about the reverse process. Having built this system very smart, can the system also make us better citizens? Very challenging question, maybe uh, a philosophical question. But there's a reason why I'm saying that. I'm saying that sometimes a system can also help us. For example, let's say I'm getting angry. I'm getting jealous. I'm giving an example. But if I get a prompt that Sajal, you're getting anxious, you're getting angry. And that may be a rest runner for many people because you are getting an alert, right? So that means I have to capture the brain signal and analyze the situation and the context and do a prediction with high degree of accuracy because you don't want to generate false alarms. So this is what I mean. And second thing is that the seamless moving. So think about everything in the world becomes smart in future. And as a human being, I cross different smart space boundary. In the morning, when I get up, I'm in a smart home, okay? And in the how everything is also smart, home networking. Then I drive a smart vehicle, self-driving car or whatever. And then on a smart road transportation, I come to a smart office. And at the end of the day, I can go to a smart shopping complex or I fly out of a smart airport. Think about it. the same individual is passing through different smart space boundaries, but our individual behaviors are different in different spaces. At home, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a son of my parents. In the office, I'm a colleague, I'm a teacher. When I go to shopping, I'm a different person when I'm flying. So think about that. Our behaviors are different. Our contexts are different. How do you manage the information seamlessly across these boundaries? Still providing the right kind of solution. The extremely challenging question. That means the seamless context recognition, multiple smart space boundaries when a human is interacting with them, right? It's almost my last slide. So. Few things that may be of interest to you in this audience. So there's a conference called IEEE Smart Computing Conference. Uh, it will be next year in Helsinki, Finland. Submission deadline will be sometime in January, February. Just look for smart-com.org. Okay, it has been announced. IEEE Porcom Pervasive Computing Conference is a flagship conference. The paper submission deadline is gone. Workshop uh, submission time is still there. Paper submission deadline was just gone on 15th of this month but workshops are there, you can submit. This would be in Pisa, Italy, March of next year, okay? And there are a lot of other conferences that may be of interest to this particular audience, okay? Okay, so I think this is my last slide. And I leave it over here and take questions. And this is, you know, this is a famous quotation by Rabindranath Tagore. And we are all in academics or we are in lifelong learning. I think this is a very good statement that I like about teacher, very crisp definition, and only poet like the Vindana Tagore could do it. And let me just stop over here. Thank you very much for your time, your invitation. I probably just consumed the entire time, but I'm ready to take questions if there's any, or any discussions, any anything that I could learn from you. Thank you very much. Very interesting keynote address, sir. I really enjoyed every minute of your talk. Thank you, thank you very much.
participants can ask any question, tell us any question, or put in the chat box. Any Please questions? do, because I, I don't want passive listeners. Any questions from participants? Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, you spoke Please. about smart chair. Uh, yeah. When the patient sits on the chair, I think he knows that he is sitting on the chair uh, to protect his he, privacy. He, he does not know. Yeah, so, ah. yeah, please, please ask the question, then I'll answer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, will you, uh, the patient is told that uh, he is sitting on a smart chair? See, that, that very interesting question. So first of all, he does not know he's sitting on a smart chair. Right? Yeah. But at the same time, we are doing the human subject study that you need to have all the approvals, right? Okay. So you go through all the approval procedure to the university and the hospital, and the okay. family members are told, because think about, we are talking about these people who have dementia, who are going through okay. Alzheimer, Parkinson. So of course, okay. most of them, they are very forgetful. Their memory okay. does not function like normal people, right? So okay. we don't want to create extra anxiety on them. They sit on the chair, but their family members and all, they know because we have to get the permission. Oh, right. that means it is for a particular disease only, not for uh, the no, common no. problem. Okay. So this one is for the mental and cognitive health, right? Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah, for the physical, we have wearables, we have other kind of technology that we do the physical health monitoring and vital sign activity monitoring. Okay, sir. Okay. But these are the ones for mental health conditions, people who have mental impairment, oh. cognitive impairment. Okay. Sir. Because Thank what you. happens, their body movement, hand. They, they, sh they shake hands, their nerves are not, right? So mm. when they sit on a chair, see, when we sit on a chair, we have a posture and also most of it, we are very quiet, mm. right? But when they sit, they, their body will move like this. Sometimes their hands will move, right? Okay. And these are the things that can be captured. And we have actually calibrated those through some thresholds and other kind of stuff. So basically the clinical test will give some information that the doctors will get. And that to the smart chair will get certain other, and their breathing rate will be different. Their heart rate will be different. And what we capture is not just the heart and breathing rate, differential heart and breathing rate. Okay. So the differential breathing rate actually gives much more information about their anxiety and the stress that they're going through. Yes. Okay. Yes. And some of those things actually are not easy to capture through clinical studies. Okay. This fine grained information, right? So we are basically augmenting the clinical study with our study and then handing over everything to this neurologist doctor we work with. Okay. And we get the ground truth from their MRI and CAT scan data. Okay. And the doctors actually does for us and we take that as ground truth. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. So I have a question, sir. How does yes, the global energy transform right. this world political equation and economic equations, smart energy, right. global smart right. energy. Right. Yes. So what is your question then? Is it How a comment? Does the smart energy transforms the global economic balance and also political balance. I don't work in that. There that, are that a lot of policy issues. Right? So when it comes to politics and uh, national boundaries, right? So there are policies. Uh, policies, right? Protocols, policies, they come in the picture, but those are important, right? I think the leaders of every country, they have to understand that one is energy, pollution, global warming, and all these things, but impact is there, huge impact, because today's world is very global, right? We are interconnected. So if you think about if the natural resources or this, the oil and all these things are not available, that will not generate energy and the ramifications, right? So I do not work in that area, but there are other people who does the policies, right? It has economic impact, it has social impact, but many of these things are policy issues, what you are asking, sir. So what happens is suppose a country which is in the tropical zone and it is able to harness solar energy, then what right. happens to the Central Asian countries which are supplying oil to the entire world and how it will impact the developed countries which are in cold regions or where the solar energy cannot be harnessed. I, I don't work in those kind of, let's say, uh, mapping, right? That impact of those in the economy, but there are other people who do, right? But, but you, you, if you know, there are predictions, right? The, all the fossil fuels, for example, or the coal and all, by 2060, 2070, they'll be all probably gone. So that's why there's a huge effort for renewable energy, right? Wind energy, uh, 
solar energy and all, right? So on one hand, yes, if you generate more solar energy, some of these countries will be, but there may be a short term, but question is even though we don't have infinite source of this fossil fuel or the coal to go for thousands of years from now, right? We are talking about now a few decades, and by the time you'll be all exhausting. So alternating sources are extremely important to look at. So we should not look at it microscopically that we generate renewable energy and that basically impacts a particular country, but that's a very short-term phenomenon. Even our longer horizon will be another 50, 60 years. If we don't have a solution by then, then we'll all will be in the dark, right? So I think we have to look at the macro scale phenomena, that what is happening. Because if we don't start the research right now in vigorously for the alternating energy sources, right? Then it will be too late. So that's my view, but I'm, yeah, economists and uh, policy makers, they look into all sorts of different things that what is the implication, what are the national uh, geopolitical implications of all these things, right? Yeah, thank you, thank you, sir. But, but these, are, these are social problems and see computer science, electronics and all, we have, a tremendous opportunity to impact the, our uh, economics, our social life, social impact, everything, right? Economic impact, social impact, civilian impact. And computing is so pervasive and data collection and all this. So I think as computer scientists, we are very fortunate to be in this discipline. Computer scientists, computer engineers, electrical engineers, all in technological field, right? Because we can impact the societal relevance uh, of our daily life and everything. That's why we talk about smart living, right? So it's not about the not making more money out of the fossil fuel energy or whatever. The question is that how does it improve our quality life? Does it make our society very safe and secure, right? Does it make our next generation in a better situation for their education, living, whatever? So that's what smart living is about. Thank it's the application you, of technology you. in the socio-technical context. Uh, I know I, I skipped many of the technical details, but if anybody's interested, you have my email address, very simple, sdas at mst.edu. Please drop me a note. I'll be very happy to discuss and exchange notes. Yes, sir. Any uh, other questions, comments? Uh, let us try to have some collaboration between UVC and uh, your university, sir. Um, I'll be very happy to you have seen my list of collaborators in India. And that's the list. I have a huge collaboration in China, in Europe. So I, I, yeah, collaboration is the key and innovation happens through collaboration. Right? Yes. It's a very enjoyable thing to do. So yes. I'll be very happy to, very happy uh, to. Uh, Shaila, if there are no more questions, uh, you can conclude the session. Next uh, speaker is waiting. Uh, Maybe we will have a collaboration between, we'll have a collaboration between UVC. UVC is going to be, I mean, autonomous college in uh, six months from now. And it will also be declared as a center of excellence. So Wonderful. maybe we can uh, have collaboration, especially with uh, uh, respect to computer science. Well, yeah, we, we, yeah our, our international, international office is extremely proactive, proactive, right? So we have a lot of collaboration in different countries, including some in India. Uh, so yeah, we can always engage our in international office and I can facilitate because we have done many of those things and I was anchor for many of these things. So yeah, we can talk about it from Savannah Gopal and take it from there. Yeah. There's Thanks. standard templates Thanks. that they use and you might have the same thing as well. So we can, our international offices can exchange notes and uh, come up with some common ground and uh, we'll go from there. Yes, thank you. I so have uh, no questions, Professor Sajal. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. As the conference chair, my profuse thanks to you for uh, having stayed late in the evening and uh, delivered this uh, wonderful talk. Okay. It's a pleasure you deliver this uh, nice Professor talk. Professor Padnak, I think yes. your video is off. Maybe I should say thank you and pay my respect before I go to bed. <laughs> okay. Thank if you. you could put, my, put your video on, please. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sajjan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very thank much. You. My pleasure. Thank you. thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Thank for enlightening and sharing thoughts on cyber physical human system and how cyber world, physical world, and uh, human world are linked. Um, thank you, sir. I request all the dignitaries and participants to kindly uh, turn on your video so that you'll have a group photograph. Thank you. Professor Venugopal, let's keep in touch.
Yeah. I am fit to you, sir. You, like your head is growing also. and growing. And, yeah. Namaskar, sir. Yeah. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste, Anand. Is it okay Triyaj if I if I leave the meeting right now? Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, and did you take Thanks. the Thank picture, you. Shweta? Did you take the picture? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Thank yes. you so much, Thank sir. You. It was Thank pleasure you. listening Thank you. to you. Thank you so much. Yes. Bye. Anand. Anand. Have, have a nice rest of the conference. Okay. Bye. Okay, sir. Bye, sir. Bye. Bye. Anand Atriya has joined. Yes, sir. That one. Namaste, yeah, yeah. Sir. Anand. Now I request Sneha, the third scholar, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, to introduce the next keynote speaker of the session, uh, Anand Atreya, sir. Thank you, Shweta. It's my privilege to introduce Anand S. Atreya, sir. Anand Atreya, sir, is currently an EVP, Engineering, and Chief Development Officer at Juniper Networks. He has completed his Bachelor's in Electrical Engineering from UVCE, Master's in Computer Science from Osmania University, and did his MBA honors from National University in US. He has also attended the Advanced Management Program at Harvard Business School. He started his career in 1987 at the Indian Institute of Science on the Earnet Project under late Professor Dr. T. Vishwanathan with a mission to develop networking expertise in India and to interconnect the various premier institutions such as the IITs and IACs. So worked at Excellent, which later got acquired by Novel, started a company that specialized in QoS software, which was acquired by Tyra Networks, and then worked for Procket Networks and later joined Juniper Network as Director of Engineering. He has for his credits several market-leading and award-winning product lines. During these 17 years, he drove several initiatives that have scaled and transformed Juniper to maintain or gain leadership position in respective segments. He also runs a world-class global engineering organization of approximately 4,500 engineers and was also instrumental in building the India Excellence Center in Bangalore, which is one of the best engineering organizations in the country. Now, Anand sir will be presenting on AIML in networking and security. Welcome you, sir. Kindly take over the session. Thank you. Thank you, Anand Atriya, for joining us and uh, delivering the address. We are indeed very fortunate to have you here. And uh, I think the entire audience will be eagerly waiting for your... Namaskar. So we can't hear you. You have to unmute, sir. Ah, okay. Now I unmute. Nimudu we lost you. Okay, sir. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Venugopal, uh, for inviting me. It's an honor. Um, and um, thanks, uh, Dr. Patnaik. And uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Shanai um, and the entire committee. So um, let me share my slides. <clears throat> I will actually um, you know, stop my video and uh, share the slide because I don't want to see have any bandwidth issues. <clears throat> so can you see the slide? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, my talk is about uh, AI and ML and networking security. Um, I think as uh, Ms. Neha introduced me, um, I am the EVP and Chief Development Officer at Juniper Networks, uh, been there for 17 years. Uh, Juniper is one of the leading network companies in the world. Um, and we build uh, routers, switches, and firewalls that basically you know, connects all of us and also secures uh, our networks. So the agenda is uh, a little bit of a personal introduction. It will be a minor repeat, um, but uh, I will also focus on, um, you know, how we have integrated AI ML into our networking and security products. Uh, I will also talk briefly about the ML framework that we have, and around seven or eight case studies uh, that applies to both networking and security. So um, personal in interaction, um, all my life um, I have spent uh, in networking. Um, I had the privilege um, you know, to start my career at the Indian Institute of Science on the Earnet project. Um, I was, I think, employee number two or three uh, under the late uh, Dr. Professor Vishwanathan. Um, he was a true visionary and I owe a lot of my success, my drive, my passion to him 
because he always used to say, you know, when they can do it, why not us? And his vision was to connect all of the, you know, great institutes of excellence in India um, and, and eventually share information, right? Um, and that was the vision. Um, and, you know, he actually guided us extremely well. I moved to the U.S. in 1988, uh, worked in, you know, several companies, but primarily at Novell uh, for around nine and a half years, um, and Juniper uh, is around 17 plus, you know, years. So I was promoted to this role around four to five years ago. Um, I run the largest engineering group in the company. Uh, it's a team of around 4,500 engineers, and almost 50 to 60% of them are actually in India, and we contribute around $4 billion in product revenues annually. Um, and one of the things that we have done is we have built a world-class organization in Bangalore. Uh, it was extremely important to harness the talent, invest, um, and you know, build the teams. Uh, in fact, I actually closed my, I mean, I locked my home. Uh, I was in India for six months uh, to build the team. Um, and you know, seven out of the, top, the first 10 guys are still with Juniper in India. Right? And they have grown with the company. Uh, they all have leadership positions and they compete and deliver on equal keel uh, you know, compared to the uh, US engineers. So I'm really proud of what we have accomplished, uh, not only for the company, but also you know, for our country. Uh, from a technology and products perspective, um, again, we are the leaders in routing, um, you know, along with Cisco and others, uh, and in switching uh, with Arista and Cisco and others and security and cloud. Um, I did my B in electrical engineering. I was the first annual in a four-year scheme. Um, then I did my MTech in Osmania. Then I did uh, my MBA in honors in uh, National University in the US. Uh, then I attended the advanced management program at Harvard. Now, um, I like the quote uh, that Dr. Das you know, mentioned, a teacher can never teach unless he's learning himself. Um, you know, I was always passionate about networking. Um, you know, uh, during my master's, my thesis was on X25. And that has served me extremely well because, you know, this goes to the literally the pre-internet days and during internet. And I would say this is post-internet where, you know, in the cloud technologies and, you know, other AML and other things have taken off, right? So I wanted to go relearn um, and be relevant uh, in the industry. So I actually, in 2019, took around nine courses and finished a professional certificate in data science. I'm still a novice, a lot to learn, uh, but I think um, I'm beginning to understand the potential and the possibilities. It actually gives me the same passion and energy that I had and you know, with networking. And I can see the impact um, of what we have accomplished um, and our contributions. Look, in spite of the pandemic, we are all you know, 10,000 miles apart we are still able to see one another, talk to one another, share information. And this is exactly the vision that we had you know, back then, right? And I'm so glad um, that you know, even uh, in India, um, that it has gone leaps and bounds in terms of the skip several generations of technologies uh, to now you know, getting ready for you know, 5G and beyond, right? I used to remember the days where it would take at least 10 years to get a phone line if you're lucky, right? Uh, but things have changed. I mean, people have, you know, dual SIM phones and multiple dual SIM phones. Um, and I think in many ways, actually, India has leapfrogged uh, in, in networking. Now, I think the time has come, um, you know, for, uh, for AI ML, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Just one slide about, you know, my company, Juniper. Uh, Juniper was founded in 1996 uh, by an Indian, um, uh, Dr. Pradeep Sindhu. Um, so he wanted to revolutionize, uh, you know, networking. Uh, all of the networking, you know, hardware that was built then was actually primarily written in software. Uh, there was no ASIC involved. Uh, Pradeep has an ASIC background. Um, he actually uh, built an ASIC um, and founded uh, Juniper in 1996. The company went IPO uh, in 1999. I think one of the largest IPOs uh, during that time. Uh, it's headquartered in Sunnyvale, um, and we have an annual revenue of somewhere between 4.5 to 5 billion, um, you know, give or take. On a global reach, we have you know 9,500 to 10,000 employees. We are in 120 locations. 
but the primary development centers are actually in North America and the US, both in, in Westford, Massachusetts, in, in Kanata and Ottawa, uh, and then in Bangalore. Um, we had a center in China that uh, you know, we shut down, but India and Northern America are the two primary development centers where ASIC development, system development, software development, and testing, all of this happens uh, in parallel, you know, seven by 24. Um, I won't go through, um, our, our mission is basically to power connections um, and empower change. And we do believe that by connecting, you know, device to device, device to human, human to human, uh, you can actually share knowledge and empower change. And our vision is to have an experience first networking so that whenever you use our technology and, you know, our devices, uh, you will have a wonderful, you know, customer experience. And Juniper is also known as a you know high quality company, um, you know um, you know higher resiliency, high availability, um, and it is a brand in the networking industry. So as I said, um, you know AI is going to have a material impact um, in our lives. Uh, Dr. Das spoke about sensor technologies and that getting tied to AI ML. And you can see the impact of AML in our day-to-day day -day lives already, right? You see driverless cars, you see drones, um, you see um, sensors, um, robots, and these are all interconnected, right? And what is it that has, you know, made this happen, right? Um, I remember in the, you know, late 80s, when I actually came to the US, Carnegie Mellon was the center of excellence and I think IBM um, had a great uh, AML program, but literally you needed a mainframe or a supercomputer to run because there was no, not enough horsepower, right? To run these algorithms. Uh, AML has been around for 50 years, I think from a technology, from a concept perspective, but the advances in silicon, the advances in storage, advances in networking has what has enabled, you know, to make it, you know, pervasive um, and influence in all of our lives, right? Uh, we are talking about driverless cars. We are talking about not even owning a car, not having a garage, because you can call a car on demand. You know, um, there is a StatMax sharing that happens. Um, you know, your, so your investment actually comes down significantly. Um, and, you know, it can, it, it, it's going to change the way, you know, we live and, you know, what we have seen over the last uh, several decades. I won't go through all of the details. Um, I think um, the, the amount of impact that this is going to have is infinite. I mean, you can think of every, I mean, one thing that fascinates me is, um, as all of us I'm sure are concerned about the, um, you know, burning of forests, right? Either through, you know, natural causes or you know, by, by humans. Uh, now you can have drones, you know, probably plant, you know, 1 million trees a day, right? So, uh, or multiple drones, you know, there are people talking about trying, you know, planting a billion trees in a day. So, the key is this opens up enormous opportunities and change the landscape um, that we haven't seen before. Um, so those are the possibilities. Now, let me talk a little bit, little bit about um, AI and ML in uh, you know, networking and security. So there are several use cases. I can think of you know, more than 20 to 30 use cases, uh, but for this talk, I focused on you know, around six or seven. Right. Um, in core networking, there is an anomaly detection, um, and then there is traffic prediction. And every networking device, uh, you have to monitor, you know, many things. And you know, one that I picked for this talk is memory leak, memory anomaly. Uh, you can also monitor CPU utilization. You can monitor fabric errors, link errors. Right. Again, there are a lot of things that you know we can do as we manage the uh, devices. Then on security, uh, you know, three use cases. One is malware detection, uh, encrypted uh, traffic analysis, and you know, DGA, which is uh, domain generation algorithms. Um, you know, DJ, they call it DGA domains. Uh, this is also uh, one of the things that uh, you know is used by malware to actually infiltrate. So I'm just giving a very simple, you know, representative of network. Um, there is a cloud, there's a cloud data center, and you have the internet, you got all of the edge and core routers, you got enterprise routers, CPE, but what manages these networks is, you know, it's an automation software, it's called the controller, 
um, I would like to call it the brain. The brain basically has to constantly monitor every device, every process in the device, every link, and constantly you know, collect telemetry, uh, analyze this telemetry, and you know, take uh, you know, remedial actions if it has to. So, um, so we have the software, uh, it's called pa Paragon Automation Suite, and we have another version called MIST, Marvis, that essentially does this, right? Now, again, uh, you should just imagine the amount of data processing that needs to happen uh, you know, by this uh, controller. Now, there's a new terminology that is being used uh, these days. It's called AI ops. Uh, it's AI operations. Um, you know, you you must have heard a lot of other ops like CD ops and Dev ops and um, you know just regular operations. Uh, but this is the new word that is getting coined because it is extremely important. I mean, human capital is very expensive. Uh, you know, particularly in the Western countries. So, and it's also becoming expensive in even in India now the more you automate, right, the more you can scale and the more you can, you know, uh, reduce the cost. And, you know, CapEx um, is given, you, you need the money to invest in CapEx, but OpEx in many cases is actually more expensive than CapEx. So a lot of the service providers and enterprise and hyperscalers, they are focusing a lot on the AI ops. And there are, you know, five pillars um, in AI operations. The first one is all about, all about planning. It's how do you plan your network, right? There are tools that says, hey, look, before we actually go and configure a network, you need a planner. So we use a planning tool to actually plan a network. The next thing that you do is you provision. Once you're planned, then you provision the network. You provision the you know, link bandwidth, the you know, quality of service policies, um, you know, security uh, policies. And there are a lot of things that you need to do to provision the network, um, you know, MPLS uh, or, you know, VPLS or uh, segment routing. Um, you know, you use all of those technologies to actually, you know, provision the VLANs, the IP address or the IPv6 addresses um, across several devices to get an entire network. Then the third thing that you do is you actually do visualization. And what is visualization? You continuously monitor the network to see if everything is okay. Uh, it is almost like an you know network operation center. You got a bunch of you know large screens, and you constantly you know monitor graphs to see what is going on um, in 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 that particular network. The next thing you do is telemetry analysis, right? Um, now that you have you know tons of these these devices in the network, and they stream a data literally every second, every sixty seconds, or every hour, you know depending on the need. So a large amounts of data um, you know, are being generated. So some of them are real time, some of them are a little bit historical. So you need to constantly you know, store them, you know, process them. So there's an analysis. Then once you do an analysis, what do you want to do with it? You have to take some actions. For example, if there is a, you know, as we speak, if there is a, you know, a degradation in uh, video performance, then the network should automatically detect that and reroute the traffic or set the right uh, quality of service parameters uh, along the routers along the way. So there's the reservation of bandwidth to have a wonderful you know, uh, user experience. And in the end, you know, what these, you know, the, all these hyperscalers and service providers and you know, network operators want is that network is self-healing, right? Uh, you must have recently heard of the Facebook outage. Um, I'm sure um, you, know, you guys in India have experienced the WhatsApp, you know, maybe going down. And these days, I mean, our life stops when these things like go down because you take it for granted. You assume that these things are, you know, highly available in a seven by 24, right? The key is you need to have, you know, these tools in place to ensure that you have a fantastic quality of experience. And more importantly, uh, you know, stuff happens in the network for reasons that you can control, for reasons that you don't control. But the key is once you have a self healing network, it automatically, you know, everything's in good shape, right? Um, so, but what you will find surprising is a lot of these network operates, they are great in planning, they're great in provisioning, and I'm sure they have a lot of telemetry, but not a lot of them have self-healing. So, you know, phones go, <laughs> they ring off the, you know, uh, the hook, um, and they're all scrambling uh, to actually uh, remediate. And that is why when you see outages, you see them not for like few seconds or few minutes, you see them for a few hours. So to me, this is the holy grail uh, for AI ops in networking. Um, so this is one thing. 
the next thing is, you know, when there is a, let's say, coordinated state att attack uh, by some, let's say, some rogue countries, um, how do you, you know, um, you know, first understand what is going on, um, then detect these attacks and, you know, divert them to a different place so that, you know, your, your assets are not compromised. There's no ransomware. Uh, your network is not compromised. Your applications are not compromised so that the networks continue to buzz, right? So one of the things that we are proud of, uh, because we power the internet today, um, you know, and we really never had any outages for the last two years, um, you know, um, for most part, and things have been, you know, rock stable, um, and they've been humming, right? And that is how, in spite of all of us, you know, working from home, uh, we have kept the networks going, and you know, it's a new way of life, um, and you know, uh, so networking has enabled that. So we have two products. One is called Juniper Paragon Automation that you know I and my team we drive you know directly, that has these five pillars, and we actually acquired a company called Mist um, you know a couple of years ago, which um, actually was one of the thought leader and they were one of the first guys to actually introduce the AI ops, and they solved um, you know actually a very simple problem and for a simple device, you know normally you would take Wi-Fi and an access point for granted. Uh, Mist actually, you know, you know, found out that, you know, there are lots of issues with Wi-Fi. You know, you got radio interference, you got, you know, VLANs going down, you got, you know, black holing, uh, some memory leaks, um, and these things constantly used to annoy, um, you know, individual home users like us, but more importantly, you know, enterprise users. So they figure that, you know, you can apply AML, you can learn what is going on, um, and you can apply it for two things. One is, um, you know, handling the tickets. Uh, you know, when, when people call customer support, but also analyzing what's going on within these APs and re remediating uh, them in you know, real time. Okay, so again, I'll just go to the basics. Um, any given ML model building, um, you got data, you got to train the data uh, using the algorithm, and you got to cleanse, you got to validate the data uh, before you actually train. So, and then, you know, you deploy this uh, and constantly, and then you get feedback, um, you learn, and this is a, a continuous closed uh, loop system, right? And the most important thing is we have to create an ecosystem that models can be improved continuously over time, right? So, you know, ML fundamentally is, you know, glorified statistics with analytics, right? So uh, that's why, I mean, if I, if I have to dumb it down, it's basically that. And, you know, this is the process like, you know, we have wisdom, uh, it is a process that we, I mean, it's, you, you will never get a perfect answer, but you have to constantly learn, iterate. And, you know, these days we have gotten used to reasonably good enough is great. Um, and I think that's where, you know, ML actually has begun to help. And, and it is very counterintuitive to think like that, but, you know, somehow the model just works. So, Again, I won't go through the gory details. Um, you know, this is a typical AI ops, you know, ML framework. Uh, it has got every acronym, you know, open source acronym that you can think of. I'm sure you guys know a lot of this. Uh, you got different kinds of databases. You got, you know, memory caches. Um, then you got message buses, um, and you got visualization tools. Um, and we also have, you know, all kinds of uh, Kubernetes kind of infrastructure. So this is what we have, right? There are two components to us. There is a cloud component where you have a lot of the cloud infrastructure, um, and then there is an ML, um, you know, infrastructure so that you know you can you can um, run these algorithms. And you've got databases and message buses. So all of these, you know, the five pillars that I talked about, you would see them as applications on top of this framework, and they constantly exchange, you know, uh, through the message buses. Uh, you know, inf information so that, uh, you know, they would use. So I'll give you a very simple example. Now, if there is some issue with the network, right, somebody in visualization or even the AML app determine that something has gone bad, then he can actually go back to the planner and say, look, next time you plan the network, you got to do this. And he can directly, you know, work with the provisioning tool to go reconfigure, reroute, uh, or even shut down a particular device or a particular link you know, based on what is going on, right? And that is why this framework is actually a closed loop self-healing system, right? And, and I always say it takes two hands to clap, 
But in this case, you know, it takes many hands to clap and they have to work in you know, tandem to have a wonderful you know, self-healing and, and good quality of experience. And this is a very typical, you know, data science toolbox. Um, you know, you got a bunch of algorithms um, and you got, you know, databases. And basically, you know, what you do is once you start running these algorithms, um, you know, initially uh, there used to be a lot of human intervention. You know, somebody looked at the data, analyzed and had to take some manual actions. But the evolution today is actually, you know, to have more, you know, what we have coined as self-driving networks. Right. Uh, to me, the self-healing, self-driving is actually one and the same. Um, the whole idea is that you limit the amount of human intervention. You make everything that is automatic, automagical, um, you know, um, so that you learn, you iterate and you, you, you improve so that you, in the end you have a completely automated system. Uh, in fact, I, I did see uh, when a one video, I don't know if it was on YouTube, an entire Mercedes Benz. Um, you know, assembly line was done by robots, right? And I think for the union's sake, uh, in the end, there were like three or go, four guys who were taking a cloth and just, you know, buffing off, um, you know, the, the Mercedes, uh, you know, the logo um, and maybe some of the, you know, dashboards and things like that. But that is the irony. The irony is that so much can be automated, so much, you know, can be used with AML, robots, you know, you name it, um, you know, that the human involvement would actually, you know, come down. So, um, you know, these are, you know, some of the other case studies. Uh, again, I captured a few of them that I'm going to talk about. But again, this is another list of, uh, you know, case studies, both in networking as well as ne network security. Uh, you know, we'll talk about anomaly detection. Um, there is also triaging correlation. Um, a lot of times, you know, look, we have this challenge. Um, our routers are as tall, you know, or even taller than human beings. It's a full rack. Um, and whenever there's an issue with, let's say, a card, right, it weighs a ton. It's not easy to ship them. So it would be fantastic that if we were able to take the card either online, inline, offline, run the diagnostics, detect what is going on, and, and there's any way we can correct in the field, uh, you know, we can uh, avoid the uh, RMA process. RMA process is the process of taking that hardware, Shipping, shipping that to a you know a manufacturing depot somewhere you know closer to that you know that particular place, and have somebody you know physically uh, do some tests to correct to, to correct. And what we find is probably eighty to ninety percent of the times there's actually no issue with hardware, right? It's a it's a ephemeral issue, or sometimes it's a software bug. Uh, but you know the customer is in you know a world of hurt. Uh, so the easiest thing to say, hey, look, take this new hardware because it used to work and, you know, just swap the existing one. So, um, you know, in the field triage and, you know, correlation is actually a great thing. And, you know, sometimes there's a lot of network configuration issues and that's exactly what happened with the, you know, the Facebook thing. So you can avoid, right? You can actually test a configuration upfront, uh, you know, uh, before you deploy. Uh, you can also test for resiliency. You can introduce a chaos monkey to actually, you know, um, you know, in, in, introduce some disturbances into the network to see how your network responds, um, and then, you know, there's this uh, thing that I talked about called automated issue remediation, and this is gold. It's worth weight. It's gold, you know, because it, it it gives the you know five or six line availability to our hyperscalers and service providers, and the other important thing uh, is incident prediction. Right. Um, and this is something this is where for me personally, this journey started is um, one day I got a call from Microsoft um, and they said, hey, listen, we have a lot of cool AML and, um, you know, why don't you come over? We want to showcase. And honestly, I didn't know Adam and from Eve when it came to AML at that point in my life. Um, I went and they showed me fascinating graphs. And, you know, these graphs, they showed a pattern where they said, look, we see this happening and four hours later, you know, the line card rebooted, right? It means it brought the entire network down or particular link down or in a set of links down, right? And invariably that happened at 3 a.m. in the morning and, you know, these guys were getting, you know, called or paged or whatever at 3 a.m. in the morning. He says, look, if I, you know that it's happening at 5 p.m., right? And it's going, and, you know, it's going to happen. This incident is going to happen at 3 a.m. in the morning why don't you save me the trouble? And if the fix is, just reboot the damn card at let's say 5.30 so that I can see it reboot, I can see everything come up, 
you know, so that I can go home and sleep in peace, right? And to me, you know, that was enlightening. Um, and this is what people look for, right? They don't look for perfection, right? Uh, Self-healing is, an, is, an, is a fantastic, is an audacious goal, but they, they want these kinds of prediction and being able to at least even, you know, as human beings, being able to correct it in, in, in real time, right? And that's when my journey um, at Juniper, you know, uh, and an interest and, you know, in AML started. Um, and we, we've come a long way, right? And I'm sure when, when I talk to, uh, you know, really the top guys in hyperscalers like Amazon or Google, you know, they tell me that they do not have um, a lot of these tools to be able to predict um, and remediate, right? And remediation is the nirvana uh, and we, we really want to get there. And the second field, uh, field is, look, I don't see networking and security as separate, right? Wherever there are bad people and bad actors, right? And there is asset and information, um, you know, security will come to play, right? So uh, I think as long as we live and even beyond, um, I see security as the next hot area, you know, that's always going to be there because, you know, people always try to beat the system. So it is important to be at least on par with these bad actors or even get ahead of their game, right? So, and again, this is something that as human alone, you cannot do it. You got to learn, you got to automate, and you got to be, you know, thinking like detectors, um, or even thinking like the bad actors, um, and you know, uh, get this implemented. So again, there are a lot of, you know, use cases, and 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 you know, um, so there are a lot of opportunities for us to do research, um, to evolve constantly um, as these technologies evolve. So, um, you know, this is about a very simple, typical use case. Um, you know, it can happen to us now as we speak. Um, you know, you have an application, it's a Zoom or Teams. Um, and it is, you know, so we are clients using those applications. It can go through the Wi-Fi, which is what's happening at my home. And then you go through a wireline switch um, and there's a firewall. Yes, there's a, you know, AP and a firewall at my home. Um, and SD-WAN is just a use case. Um, and, you know, you pretty much go to the cloud. Internet today, these days, is pretty much, you know, to going to a, a cloud data center. Uh, you know, typically, it's an Amazon, Google, um, you know, Microsoft, or maybe even Oracle or Alibaba. Um, it's, you know, you, you go there, right? Now, what happens is a lot of things can go wrong, right? Um, you know, my daughter could be video streaming right now. My son could be video streaming, my wife. So this imposes a lot of bandwidth. Uh, so, which means that this video conference, um, you know, um, uh, could get affected because this is, you know, real, real-time streaming. So, you need to have certain guarantees. Um, you know, same thing would happen at the switch. There could be a bug in the switch. Uh, the link could have errors. Maybe it's not seated properly. So, the net net takeaway is, you know, you can, you do, and we do, right? We face a lot of issues uh, in, in a particular network, and this just gives, you know, one flow. Now. You can, you, the actions that you can take, right, um, is basically two things. One is, you know, proactive, uh, where you do self-driving and Marvis is our, you know, you know ML, uh, like IBM Watson. So we call it Marvis uh, at Juniper. So you basically, you can do radio resource management, or maybe you can reboot the box. Maybe it requires a, you know, software upgrade, right? Or a firmware upgrade. Uh, or you can say, look, this box has gone kaput. So we need to RMA, right? Um, and the reactive is, you know, first you're able to predict and do these things upfront, or as I said before, you, you can you know, troubleshoot uh, or you can be, you know, reactive uh, after the event has happened. Okay. Now, um, AI ops um, in networking and security, as I said, it's a new, you know, buzzword in the industry today. Um, the way we look at AI ops is, you know, there are, we call it day zero, day one, day two, day three, and day n, um, you know, like that. So what is day zero? The day zero is, you know, whenever you get a device, you actually, you connect, um, you know, it could be a simple switch, it could be a Wi-Fi, and it could be an existing, you know, you know uh, a brownfield switch, you adopt a new one, or you claim a new, you add a new one. Um, but, but net net takeaway is you're adding a device to the network, right? So as soon as you, you know, add a device to the network, you know, basically it needs to be configured with ZTP, you onboard the switch, you register the switch um, and make sure that it's operational. Then on day one, you know, what you do is you actually, you know, get the system configured. Um, excuse me one second. Sorry. 
uh, yeah, on, on day one, you, um, you, you know, basically you, you know, distribute the configuration, you make sure that you get a view, you set all of the ports and the switch profiles, uh, you know, depending on the, you know, type of network, right? Um, and day two is you basically start monitoring, right? If something goes, up, goes wrong, you basically uh, learn from it uh, or you've already learned from, you know, previous deployments and then you actually start, you know, either fixing it or you know being being responsive to uh, you know customer tickets, right? And day two plus is you know basically to ensure that you know you have a wonderful you know user experience. Um, I mean it, it doesn't mean that it's going to take three to four days, um, but this is this is the you know the terminology that we use. But the net idea again is you know harping on you know back to this, right? If you know I tell you, hey, do you know that during the course of this you know conference? You had these issues with AP, with these switches on your WAN links, um, you know, on your, you know, with your applications, and they were all, you know, automatically corrected, um, and you didn't even know about it, right? And you know, this is how uh, that we've learned and fixed it, uh, and that would that's a wonderful feeling that somebody took care of this seamlessly for you, um, you know, and you in the end you had a wonderful, you know, networking experience without any chaos, without any of the, this madness that, you know, stuff happened and, you know, it took, you know, we took care of it seamlessly. I think that that is the holy grail that we are getting to. And, you know, at Juniper and I'm sure in many other companies, uh, we have actually made a lot of progress and I see this evolving over a period of time. Now, I'll just, again, I'll give you, you know, these are all the common issues. Uh, this is statistically, you know, broken down, you know, I can't connect what is going on. You know, my Wi-Fi is slow or intermittent, AP rebooted or disconnected. You basically need to respond. And, you know, there's a story about Dell. Whenever you call Dell, you know, uh, when you say my, you know, PC is not working, you know, the first question they ask you is, sir, do you see a power outlet? And do you see a power cable? Um, and have you connected the plug into the socket, right? Now, we will find as technologists, we'll find it amusing, but a lot of the people out there are not technologists, right? Uh, they don't understand a lot of these things. So, you know, sometimes you have to go to, you know, those basics uh, to be able to solve some ticket issues. And the idea is that the paradigm shift is, you know, <clears throat> managing devices is a passe. I mean, people take it for granted these days. I think what people are looking is for an end-to-end, -end, you know, great customer experience, right? And, you know, you see in, even in India, you know, even with Ola and, you know, all the taxis and, you know, food, food getting delivered at home, that we all strive for a fantastic, uh, you know, service and a user experience. Uh, and that's what we want to do in the networking and, you know, security industry. Um, this case study, again, um, again, this is thanks to my team. Um, I've got a bunch of data scientists and data engineers, both in the networking and the security group. Uh, this is their effort. Um, so one of the things is, you know, um, again, if you look at AAML, there's a lot of buzzwords and people throw a lot of acronyms at you. Uh, I have tried to keep it simple, right? So uh, this is again, because I've learned a little bit, I, I should say I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a novice, right? I'm able to, one good thing, one of the good traits I have is I have the ability to dumb down a lot of these things because I'm not that smart. So I have to keep it simple. So the way I've dumbed down is, look, don't talk to me about algorithms, right? So first, whenever you talk about, talk about an algorithm, tell me what is it, why would you use it, when would you use it, where would you use it, how would you use it, and when will you not use it, right? So if somebody starts thinking about this, then you know, they won't uh, take uh, you know, the plethora of algorithms that you, ha you have there and try everything you know, without you know, understanding why they even need to use it. So if you look at anomaly detection, right, what is it? It's basically we want to predict and mitigate anomalies in the network. Uh, something could be wrong with the radio. Something could be wrong with the VLAN. Something could be wrong with the link, right? Um, maybe it's a wrong software. But the idea is that you know you use different models, and in this case they used LSTM. They you used isolation forest, and I believe there's something new called Profit. They use these algorithms to monitor and detect what is going on, and based on the learnings, they were able to auto correct. Right, so we we monitor close to 300 million events per day. Um, then we constantly run these, you know, models, you know, day in day out. And what is the outcome and what is the action is to if it's a config issue, go fix the config. Uh, if you got to reset the radio or you want to change the, you know, radio, you know, uh, parameters, 
um, you actually go, you know, you're able to change a particular, you know, parameter to so that it's effective. Um, so here is a very simple, you know, graph. Uh, it's a little dated, but it is real. Um, if you look at, um, again, I won't go through all of the colors, but the most important color is blue. And, you know, the key thing is a rising, you know, arrow in the, in the right direction where more blue is actually good, right? And when will you get to more blue? Uh, more blue means that, you know, a, there was a virtual network assistant. It's like a bot, right? That's constantly runs. And it was able to answer and resolve your questions, right? Without any human intervention. So the key is for it, for the, the green bar to grow tall, um, you need, absolutely, you need to have a lot of data first. So it's all about telemetry, right? So the reason you see reds and yellow is because as you increase the number of devices, as you face, you know, different kinds of issues, that telemetry is important, um, you know, but the, you know, the expectation is that the, you know, if the green is around 50% or more, it means you, you, you have avoided so many tickets and, you know, and that's a cost to the company, right? And also it affects the, you know, end-to-end -end customer success. And this is another graph, uh, graph where the AI ops efficacy drives end-to-end uh, -end customer success. Um, and again, you know, when Marvis had the data, right? They were able to answer, you know, 70, 80, 90% of the time because they had the data and they were able to learn and they will they were able to respond. And this was done primarily for the, you know, the missed, you know, the Wi-Fi, um, you know, AP and you know that particular network. Okay, again, uh, you know, uh, trending up, more dark greens, good. Um, the next one is the traffic reroute based on prediction, right? So what happens is. Uh, and this is something that I constantly see uh, with, um, you know, a lot of the networking providers and hyperscalers. They constantly monitor traffic patterns, right? It's very analogous to our, you know, whatever traffic you see on the streets, right? So you see, you know, a pileup around a certain time. So we either try to leave early or tree, you know, leave late, right? So networking traffic, I don't think is very different. Because you know people start their work, you know they watch uh, you know videos or you know TV, streaming TV or whatever it is, you know when they go home. So you know over a period of time, the traffic you know pattern uh, is is established, right? So there's a lot of learning that you know we can do, you know over you know days, weeks, months, and years on the nature of traffic. Now what happens is whenever there is an event that's going to happen, right? And it has happened, let's say, you know, over periods of time, uh, one is a planned event or an unplanned event, then you will start seeing uh, the, the buildup of traffic, the buildup of congestion, um, you know, because, um, you know, there's a new, new event that is going to drive more than, you know, what was happening in parallel. It could be a cricket match, it could be a soccer match, it could be a concert. <coughs> so you see a lot of that happening. So it is extremely important for the you know networking operator not to congest the network like it happens you know in in in, in many of the highways and many of the streets that we do drive because you know you don't have the planning um, if you you know just take a step back um, again I don't know if we, you guys use Waze uh, in India but here you know we have two um, you know like Google Maps and Waze is actually part of Google it beautifully reroutes and you know gives us the most optimal route. Um, you know, trying to, it, it's also constantly learning, right, from, from our smartphones, and that is tied to the car, and based on that, it, it actually reroutes traffic through streets that you would not even imagine of going through, right, but the idea is that it is so accurate, it's accurate to the minute, right, the reason is it is able to predict, um, you know, extremely well, it has learned from millions and millions of, you know, drivers and cars, um, and the same model ac can actually apply to networks. Right. Um, again, um, you the problem statement is to forecast traffic and reroute, and you know we, we do this right. Um, I have a demo where we are streaming video. There are two streams, and if we find that there is one link is getting congested, we simulate the congestion. We automatically you know reroute the traffic, and you will see one uh, you know video stream is actually the same video stream having you know freezing. Right, it freezes a lot. The other one is actually you don't even see a flicker. Right. Um, again, same thing applies. Um, you always collect statistics. You do, you know, um, run the model over and over and over and learn and you know improve and iterate um, and use different models. 
uh, but then you also gather real time data apply you know based on what you've learned um, and then you know you 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 know take the corrective action again you know in, in this case also they use uh, lstm and i believe there's something called neural profit uh, that i'm not aware of um, you know to to be able to do tra traffic prediction right Um, the second one is a memory leak. Um, it's a you know very uh, simple use case, right? Um, a lot of us write software, and software have bugs, and then sometimes the memory leak is very obvious. Sometimes it happens over a period of time, and then everything freezes, right? So again, um, you know, uh, the data collection is per application memory. You collect periodically, so you kind of understand, you know, based on number of routes and number of VLANs or whatever the, you know, the feature or, you know, parameter is, you know, what each process, you know, it's low watermark, high watermark, you kind of get a, get a feel. But if you find that something is going out of whack, right, because there's a memory, you know, leak and all of the parameters are all the same. So for example, let's say you had a million routes and you got, you know, let's say hundred meg of memory and, when you go to a, you know, let's say 5 million routes, obviously the memory should go proportionally or, you know, depending on the routes, it should taper off. But what you cannot see is that, you know, you've gone, you're still at a million routes and the memory is gone from 100 meg to half a gig, right? That means obviously something is going bad. Um, in some cases, um, it can be corrected. Uh, in some cases, uh, we restart the application. And again, depending on the nature of the application, you know, let's say if it's a routing application, you know, maybe there's a way to reroute or keep the forwarding plane, you know, continuously, you know, send the traffic while you actually go uh, restart the app, right? Um, so you can do a lot of, you know, cool things like that. Uh, but again, um, it's a, such a simple use case. And, you know, we do face it all the time because, you know, we don't have, you know, perfect coders, uh, you know, these days. Next one is, you know, it's memory anomaly, uh, which is uh, which is very similar to what I said, right? So um, one was a leak, right? But I also talked about anomaly in that, in the sense, if you know that a particular application has to take a certain amount of memory, and if you find that they're going out of whack, um, which means obviously either there's a memory leak or there is a config issue or there's an attack, right? Uh, that is causing, you know, these guys to constantly allocate it and hog all of the memory. And by using, you know, clustering te techniques, you can actually, um, you know, uh, easily isolate, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, bad situations um, and you can take, you know, remediation action uh, to, uh, you know, go either fix the configuration, restart the process, or uh, even, you know, flag, a, flag to an operator that something is not, uh, you know, going well, you know, with that particular device. Okay, um, so I covered a few of the networking use cases. Um, you know, let me uh, address the security side, right? Um, so again, the vision is the controller not only manages the devices, um, it also manages the applications or processes or protocols running on those devices. Then it also handles, you know, um, the links, uh, the connectivity, so that if there is a concerted attack, right, by bad actors, because normally these guys are very smart, they don't attack one device, there is a concerted attack that happens. Um, and you'll be amazed, and it happens to even a lot of the companies that you would not even dream of uh, would, you know, face these issues. And these are all the, all the brand ones, right? Um, so they undergo a lot of concerted attack. And it's extremely important for us to first even realize uh, that you're being attacked. Uh, and take remedial action. Um, a lot of times, you know, the FBI here actually calls these companies and say, hey, did you know that you were attacked for the last, you know, 15 days, right? And a lot of times the companies don't have a clue. So it is, security is an integral part, right? I think it is hand in glove with networking. Um, so it's extremely important to uh, not only manage the device, but also the network, right? So, um, so what happens is, uh, you know, we have to, you know, in malware detection, uh, you want to predict if a software is malicious, right? And, you know, software is not just some executable, not some application. Software these days can actually be embedded in documents. It can be in your Word, in your PowerPoint, in your Adobe, um, so that, you know, these things are all embedded in your documents. And, you know, there are, um, you know, people um, who are not aware of this thing. They randomly go clicking, or sometimes, you know, if you look at the domain names, 
uh, they actually mislead with you know um, you know with the spelling you know mistake and if you're not careful right um, you know you 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 could end up in the wrong place a lot of that happens in email right these days uh, if you go use any email address whether it's an outlook or google mail or whatever they really don't show the complete headers right they just say hey it came from dr venugopal right but if you actually look at the address it may actually be a bogus address now a lot of these email clients don't show the address right so for me you know i actually enable full header view right now it takes a lot of space to view but that's okay i want to be cautious and i'll give you my own personal case um you know and you, you'll find this amusing um somebody called up juniper um hr and you know this guy went one after another and somehow had my information changed where actually 50% of my money was actually transferred to a different account and you know i'm a simple guy with simple living so i didn't even know this was happening so for 10 months my salary was going to some other account right and this happened with the combination of email phishing right and also by humans okay and i didn't even know about this right and one day my you know um, finance person called me and said hey you know they call me andy here so hey andy look um, you know your account is locked uh, we are not able to deposit money i said my god i mean did i run out of money right um, so uh, did did was there an old draft or something then i looked at the account number it was not my account number right so so where i'm going is it's extremely important security is an integral part and even though we believe that we know security a lot of us uh, because you know it's a it's a tiring thing to be constantly on guard we actually make mistakes and that can be fatal um, and that happens to everybody and the same person tried to attack uh, you know four guys at juniper but based on what we had done uh, we were able to you know seal it off right we were able to secure uh, you know network do simple things like hey this is an external email don't click on any link period right so and even now today we exchange a lot of things the you know whatsapp we have to assume that the sender is actually is the right person uh, it's not being faked uh, but we have to be very careful about you know when we when we click on these links right so it is important to automate this to the extent that we can again uh, the bad actors are always smarter than us so um, you know we have a product called srx uh, which actually i'm proud to be and say i was the father of the product um so this is something that we have built you know over the years where you know emails are constantly monitored and then copies of these files are submitted to the cloud because you know these are intensive um and then they are analyzed and based on history and you know if you have learned that you know one you know employee in the company um you know uh, had this file and it was a bad one then when we can immediately you know push the policies to the device and actually uh, shut it off right so even here um you know you want to predict if a software is malicious um again you constantly collect data and the data can be in form of packets it can be in form of files um and you you know there's a lot of both static and dy dynamic analysis that's being done again a lot of these things you know we use uh, clustering techniques and you want to make sure that you know the positive rate uh, the true positive rate is actually you know is pretty high and you know like you know a windows defender does or mcafee does the idea is that when you find that something is go, goes wrong you want to do things you want to quarantine so you want to study further if you want to or you delete the malware right so that that's one thing that we do and um so we have this thing called advanced threat protection uh, you know we are actually rated extremely high in the gartner quadrant uh, quadrant in this um and you know we've been extremely successful because this you know we have mastered you know over several years um and we also share information with you know other companies uh, in terms of when we detect um, malware the second one is traffic uh, in encrypted traffic insights um you know uh, back in the days in 1996 or 1995 when the internet really started or when http was introduced um everything used to be you know open right it was http 1.0 and 1.1 but now uh, later um you know in the late 90s https was you know introduced ssl uh, was found to be an easy way of to um, to encrypt a, a particular you know session um you know instead of vpns because that was not scalable so uh, you know traffic became encrypted and you know slowly but steadily a lot of the sites uh, began to encrypt uh, you know their pages and their sites and now what happened was now google with the speedy and other stuff 
um, has helped uh, you know accelerate uh, you know encryption of traffic. Now it's a good thing and the bad thing. The good thing is you know when you're secure, it is secure. The bad thing is you know people in between cannot um, you know uh, intercept the traffic easily and figure out what is going on because you don't have the certificate, you don't have the you know the encryption keys and you know other other information to figure out what is going on in, with that particular session. For example, someone could be hijacking your session, right, at source itself. Um, and then, you know, there's no way for us to know easily, right? But fortunately, again, you can use, you know, AIML to uh, kind of understand, you know, traffic patterns. So for example, um, you know, what they have found out is um, as part of the transport layer security, uh, they, you know, study the handshake, you know, packets you expect a particular you know behavior and whenever there's a bad actor you know something there changes uh, so then you can actually get curious um, and in some cases um, you know they you know actually install a client called netscope which acts to intercept um, so that in the end if you want to decode the packet you can actually decrypt because they have the keys uh, you know in a, in, a, in a secure place so that you know exactly what is going on right um, so things like this um, are actually again we use very similar to the previous uh, models. Um, you know, again, this cannot be done uh, on the device because these are all very CPU intensive. So what we do is we ship it off to the crowd, you know, clouds, um, and then we do the processing. Then you push back, uh, you know, the policies to secure the router. And sometimes it may be after the fact because the session may be short lived so that, you know, the next time, um, you know, you figure out something like this happening either to you or someone else, you can actually take immediate action because you know you have knowledge about that, right? Again, the ROC curve, you know, this looks uh, perfect. Uh, I think it's probably 99 or even close to 100 percent, you know, accurate. Um, so um, again, uh, this is over, over a lot of years we have actually you know trained these models to actually more be more accurate. Okay. And uh, last but not the least um, is the domain generation algorithms. Um, Domain generation algorithms are basically, um, you know, used by malware. Um, people who introduce malware, they have this ability to generate lots of domain names, right? And then, you know, because mal you're already infected, and you know, the the malware agent is able to generate a lot of domain names, and they use a subset of them to be used for command and control, uh, because once you have, you know, so many it's you know, very difficult to chase them, right? This is like, a, again, it's almost like a coordinate attack. Um, so, um, you know, so again, this is something that you cannot, you know, be sequential. So whenever we detect there's an, any anomaly in you know, queries, um, again, you know, we know all of the good names and we know all of the bad names. So again, you learn about these bad names, right? And, you know, IP addresses are one thing, um, but again, you know, bad names are another thing. Um, so the idea is that you constantly learn, you, you know, you cluster them and you basically, um, you know, you, again, you have, um, employ the same uh, neural network, you know, kind of classifiers to isolate these domain names. Then you can say, hey, you know, google.com is a good one. Facebook is, you know, a good one. Uh, UBC.org is a good one. So you can, you can actually, you know, classify a good and the bad and, and isolate, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's the way and a lot of the botnets, which is basically malware distributed across in the network, um, you know, they use, you know, these patterns to, uh, you know, generate a lot, a lot of, I would say, fake or even, um, you know, uh, domain names, and then use only some of them, which they know are the good ones, to actually do a, you know, control and command, you know, considered attack. Okay. So um, that's all I have from a uh, from an AML perspective. Um, again, the list can go long, right? Um, you can actually do it for, you know, quality of experience. You can do it for, you know, quality. Uh, uh, so for for traffic classification, whether you want to, you know, assign an elephant flow or a mice flow, uh, we can do adaptive load load balancing. Uh, we can do green routing. You know, for example, if you want to make sure that you know we're all, you know, eco friendly and eco sensitive, you want to make sure that you route a packet across devices that, let's say, are eco friendly or green enabled. Uh, you can do, you know, do those things. So the applications are, you know, infinite. Um, just even in networking and security, and you know, leave alone, you know, the rest of the things that we can do with AML. Um, 
and you know these are some of the references that I have used. Um, you know, the first paper is actually fantastic. I think it's around 97 or 100 pages, um, and basically. Uh, it's a survey of all of the machine learning algorithms for networking. Um, so I think you know I, I researched over 100 pap papers as I learned um, you know, as, as you know over the over the you know, month and last couple of years. What I found that you know this one paper covers a lot of uh, ground, right? Um, and again, if you are interested, uh, you know I have a lot more references. Uh, I'm sure you you guys know uh, quite a bit, uh, but you know these are some of, some of the references that I've used uh, over the last couple of years. And again, uh, feel free to reach me, you know, anytime. Um, you know, the email is asatre at juniper.net um, or even asatre at gmail.com. Uh, I'm happy to respond. Um, and my LinkedIn is, um, you know, linkedin.com slash in slash anandatreya. Okay. So, wonderful. Um, yeah. Wonderful presentation, uh, anandatreya. I listen to every word of yours and I... I mean, uh, enlightened by what were the range of topics which you have covered in this last one hour. Thank you very much, Anandatri. Thank you, Dr. Venugopal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If there is any question from the participants, please do ask or you can post it in the chat box. Sir, uh, there is a question from Arun Kumar. He's asking, uh, are you following what... Uh, well, how are you allowing these five pillars in your organization? Is it through your product or some monitoring solutions? It's uh, through my product, right? So we have uh, something called the Paragon Automation Suite. Um, you know, as I showed, uh, you know, the framework slide where you have the cloud infrastructure, you have the AM. In just five minutes, I'll come back to you and uh, on the... Okay. Um, so we have the AML ML infrastructure and you have all of these applications, these five pillars as uh, applications running on this particular framework, right? And they're all interconnected. Uh, and the interconnection is the databases, the message bus where we exchange, uh, you know, state information and other uh, information. Okay, sir. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Uh, yes, so, this is here. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, so I had a question regarding the data part. Because what I understand is enterprises typically have this uh, archiving concept, right? So you would be archiving your logs and things after a certain amount of time. So then yeah. how do you do the data validation and the model validation? Because let us say after a month from now, Right, you may not have the actual data by which uh, the model was derived, uh, right? On which the prediction would be happening. Yeah. So, so depending upon the um, you know use case, um, depending upon um, you know the model that you use, sometimes we archive data for days and months together, right? I mean, I, I would not segment it time just time based because if this you're collecting data once per day, right? Um, that then of course you can save it for years. If you're collecting, you know, every five seconds, probably you can only do it for, you know, a couple of months. So the idea is that it's also limited by, you know, your database, um, you know, and, and databases are expensive. So again, the mod, it is garbage in, garbage out, right? So it is all based on the data. And when you start looking at the, the output, the outcome, the accuracy, then we will go back and fetch, you know, more data as we need. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so look, the, the key thing that I found out is there are two components, right? So, you know, every present moment, right, was a future moment at some point. Every present moment becomes a past at some point, right? So the idea is that how much do you want to keep it real time in your cache, right, in the memory, because that's also expensive, and how much of it you want to keep it in a database? And of course, beyond that is archive, right? And a lot of times, maybe you just have to go recycle data because, you know, this is like a river, it's constantly moving and you never enter the same river twice. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. sir, there is a question from Mari Gauda. He's asking, is there any security tool designed by Juniper for the IoT security? Um, we don't have um, in particular for IoT security, uh, even though I believe an application is being developed as we speak. But again, the concepts that you apply to any security device, you can or any networking device, you can actually apply to an IoT device too, right? It's it's what kind of telemetry that you can 
uh, gather and what controls does the IoT device or the IoT controller gives you um, is, is the uh, thing to keep in mind. But yes, I mean, so, so the straight answer to your question is yes, whatever we have done is possible to apply to IoT, but we don't have anything like IoT specific. Okay. Right. Look, what I have done is, um, you know, I always believe in this, right? Um, first, it's very important to lay the foundation because I think once the, you know, foundation is solid and stable, then you can build the towers, destroy the towers, rebuild the towers in a heartbeat. If the foundation is quicksand, trust me, even, you know, um, you know Burj Khalifa is not going to stand, right? Because everything will start collapsing. And you've seen that in Bangalore, right? Um, you've seen some of the houses, you know, collapse. Uh, that is a testament to say, I think it's okay to take time to invest in the foundation. Once that is done, it, you know, we call it land and expand, right? You, the moment you have a solid foundation, you can undo and redo, you know, do all the time, right? In a matter of days and weeks. Uh, but if the foundation is bad, you know, everything goes out the window. Okay, sir. Thank you so much for your valuable insight on applications of AI and ML on networking and security. Thank you so much for joining us for this keynote session. Thank you. And, um, you know, have, you a, very have a very um, successful uh, conference and uh, stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chandra. Thank you, very thank you, thank you Dr. sir. Uh, Dr. Venugopal. Thank you. I thank uh, Vice Chancellor, Bangalore University, Dr. Venu Gopal, sir, Principal UVCE, Dr. H. N. Ramesh, sir. Dr. L.M. Patnaik sir and Dr. Deepa Chennai ma'am and all the participants for joining this keynote session. With this, we have come to an end of the second day IC in Pro 2021 morning keynote session. I request everyone to kindly join the following sessions which starts at 11.30 a.m. using the Zoom links provided through email and WhatsApp. Kindly join five minutes prior to the session. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. 11.30 or 11? 11.30 or 11, Sneha? Ma'am, 11 to 11.30. 11, 11, 11.30, ma'am. 11.30. Tea break, ma'am. I mean, oh. it's break. Tea oh. break, huh? virtual tea break. Huh? Virtual. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay. Thank oh. you.